Well, the, uh, this particular book, or author of this work, rather, has uh, got a rare review from a lot of uh, you know, his uh, peers, uh, some who have described it as something well, out of this world, <laughs> and especially because the kind of style, the writing style, and the rest uh, is, uh, is a big accommodation all the way. Uh, I mean, since he published this particular work. We're talking about uh, our author, Joshua Omeka. He's also, he is the author of uh, Joe Colatinia. It's actually, I would say, it's a consortium of uh, poetry works that he has done over time uh, and over 49 cha or 40 chapters of this book. He'll be joining us live uh, via Skype uh, from uh, the UK where he currently resides. Uh, good morning, uh, Joshua. Or oh, let me call you Joe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can call me Joe, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I hope the weather is treating you well over there. Um, it's fair enough, actually. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right. Let's go into this. Uh, I, I, this is like your seventh um, or third uh, work, so to speak. And uh, yeah, this is quite different uh, if you look at, uh, because I, I've been able to research and find yeah, some um, of your other work. It's, it's quite very different. different. It is. Yeah. You know, I mean, Joe Colettina is quite different from other books that you have written. Let's look at the uh, approach you use, the um, narrative style. Uh, what would you describe, or how would you describe your own style in, you know, giving your readers the kind of uh, self-examining, <laughs> you know, uh, readership or way to read it? Because when you read it, uh, you could put yourself right into some of these uh, poems. Yeah, that's actually true. So I, I call it the narrative approach or the narrative form of poetry because um, the aim of this is to allow um, anyone of any class or knowledge of English to be able to read it easily without having to um, feel as if they need to open a dictionary. Let's talk about uh, what we talked earlier on about your approach, your uh, narrative uh, writing style. And of course, before uh, Victor gives you some of the things that he said he found really, really you know, evocative. <laughs> All right, go ahead, uh, Joshua. So um, this, this narrative approach, the aim of this approach is to enable you put yourself in the place of the writer and disconnect yourself. So apparently the um, approach is to make you visualize other people's personal experience without having to experience it personally. All right. Uh, I, I, of course, um, make you, I mean, experience it personally. And, uh, yeah, you know, when I look at some of the, um, uh, the poems, if I have to pick out some of them, uh, a friend of mine, uh, I mean, is talking about a, an issue between yeah. your friend and uh, I think your lover. They also have one that talked about uh, Danilo's work, who talked about labor, you know, the, um, yeah. uh, the daily activities of a, of, a, of a laborer, you know, I said, yes. Now, if you look at, um, all the work together. I want to believe that it took some time for you to write all of that because each step, each yeah, of did. your poem, you know, has a different emotion from it. So, I mean, how many that's years true. did it take you to write all of this? To be honest, um, that's an archive uh, from 2019 to 2022. So I selected them randomly. And the aim of this coletania, this anthology of poems, is to enable you uh, become equipped with life activities, life experiences that you yourself has never experienced. So when it comes to life matters, there's a difference between experience and wisdom. Most times people think they have wisdom, but it's experience they have. But at the end of the day, this then becomes an experience for you to use to guide yourself. Now, if you review one of the works, um, that's um, Flies of Wilderness. So it talks about... Yeah, it talks about an immigrant that came to a foreign land with the aim of getting a greener pasture or having their life settled and everything. Let's talk about the rush with the jackpot team that um, Nigerians are coming to the UK and all. When you tell them the UK is not really what you expect it to be, they usually don't believe. You can tell them that life here and life in Nigeria is almost the same. The only difference is at least you have hope that maybe there's a reliable transportation network. But aside that, it's still the same economy um, crisis everywhere across the globe with the increase in prices and everything. So when 
that the immigrants came and the immigrants was expecting things to go his way, but it wasn't really going his way. He felt the need to go back home, but then he remembered the reason he left home in the first place was to be fulfilled over here. So he the needed to I pat himself at the back by those words in the poem. That's flies of wilderness. If you take your time to read it, you could see it says that or oh, it's the 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 sounds of home recalls. You know, it's like home is calling him, but he feels the need to remain through the hardship and even though sometimes the experience is good, sometimes the experience is bad, he wants to stay behind and be fulfilled as he planned to be in the foreign ground. Yeah. Okay, isn't that the same? So what's the difference between uh, uh, Flies of Wilderness and uh, the Colored Dreams? Because it looks that both of them, you know, address the same issue. So the Flies of Wilderness is bespoke. The Colored Dreams is the rugged version. <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about some of the things that influence your, your work, basically, uh, Joe. Are there specific poets or literary movements that actually influence your, your collections and, of course, your poetic works as well? Um, I'm, I'm actually part of the Poetry Society in the UK. So basically, I get to read poems of older people and um, I receive archives of past laureates here in the UK. So I have access to more than hundreds of thousands of poems. Um, in my free time, I tend to go over them. So I don't have a specific person that inspires me because what that means is if the person's work become unavailable, then I myself will lose my own form and I'll be forced into a writer's block. So I actually gain inspiration from everything that surrounds me. I could literally be going to work and I see a tree, I see the moving train, I see children licking ice cream, I see people having issues. I could write a poem out of that. So I don't really write based on just, um, how would I say it? I don't really write based on what I'm dragging or what I'm tapping currents from. I write based on my imagination and the ability to tell what's inside of me in a narrative way that anybody can understand it as they read it. Mm. Uh, but then uh, I, I, I read somewhere where you also mentioned the work of, uh, I think, um, him and Leeway or there about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, uh, you know. But are you saying, did yeah. that inspire a bit what this particular Joe called it um, It actually did because I was... I was, in fact, um, To Kill a Mockingbird was the book that made me start writing poems because I was inspired by how Apali was able to tell the story of Articus Finch and his daughter and the son as well. How she was able to twist everything to become so simple in 1971 or 73, writing about 1929. And I really... I think I was not able to get the year immediately, but as I read on, I realized I was 1929 because of the the Wrigley double mint and some mm -hmm. other factors that came in place. So I really wanted to try my own thing. But when I started writing poems, trust me, I used to bin it because when I finish writing and I really I'm like, it's not making sense. But the truth is, when you write, it doesn't need to make sense to you in the first instance. You could always go back to modify what you have written. That was how I was able to perfect my skills to the, to the extent that I'm able to write without modifying anymore. Mm. Uh, let's, let's talk about the role of poetry, basically, in the society, because we have quite a lot of young mm -hmm. persons now who want to become poets. You know, let's talk about a little bit about uh, the roles of poetry in the society and, of course, how your work in our vision can also contribute to some of the roles that you might uh, give us now to uh, the, the society at large as well. Yeah, so... Can you hear me? So uh, basically, in the society, um, everything that surrounds us is poetry because, for instance, before a musician is able to write their music, they need to literally pen the lyrics. Before you are able to do anything, you need to read the brief. Before anybody is able to create something, they need to literally write um, a descriptive vision of what they intend to do and their goals alongside it. So basically, all of of these things are poetry. What surrounds us is poetry. This is what really matters to life. But we feel because uh, there's really not enough money in poetry or something. The truth is, as a writer, you need to get a side also. In fact, writing is for leisure. You're not writing professionally, except you're an underwriter. And then you're getting the block money from these massive companies. But notwithstanding, when you're writing 
in the form of art, that's literature. You are doing it because you are in, you are intending to touch the lives of older people that surround you. Take for instance, Things Fall Apart by Shinoa Shibe. There's no one that would read that book and not feel inspired to, you know, like, like they won't feel inspired to be themselves. Like the story of Okunko in that book, or you pick up uh, The Gods Are Not To Be Blamed by Ulum, and then you read that and not feel the need to adhere to warning that has been given to you or to pay more attention to things that are said to you. There's so many of these books that we have learned one or two things from. But at the end of the day, what poetry does is it sparks your mind. It inspires you to not just be a better person, but to have an idea of what that topic is talking about without having to read a full novel. Like anyone that reads A Colored Dream would obviously catch what it means. Anyone that reads The Surrendered Man would understand what religion is about when you follow God, because there's no religion that doesn't believe in God. Anyone that reads Danilo the Fanboy would understand that people who are laborers, people who are professionals, they only do the nine to five because they have bills to pay and because they have family to cater for. They don't do it because they love to work. Nobody loves to work. But when you read Danilo the Fanboy, then you're inspired to keep going because at the end of the day, your needs are met. So many okay, of but, uh, quickly, like that. Just, uh, you have a part that you said Joe Colatina from um, the Ghana side. What exactly is that trying to <laughs> portray? Okay, so the reason I wrote that was because I, I have this friend from way back. We always argue about Ghana, Nigeria, Ghana, Nigeria, Ghana, Nigeria. And she would always say something like, Ghana is better than Nigeria. So um, the, the, the insight I have of Ghana was what I used to write that poem. And it was like an argument. If you see, the poem started in form of an argument. That's ourself and myself arguing. Like, I just created that. Not like that sort of argument ever existed. And then I, I started, where the poem started from was, they said I was some, uh, they, they saw me in Kente, so they thought I was some Akwaba. I'm just taking a cruise to Accra. I'm probably going to Coco Vanilla. That's a very big restaurant in Ghana. It's not my flavor of ice cream because when you hear Coco Vanilla, you think that's an ice cream. So I just mixed words to it. But anyone that is from Ghana, when they read that poem, like they will be very happy because I was able to write about Ghana without having to ever visit Ghana. Ghana I was, yeah. Even though I was invited for the Bagia Festival, but I couldn't go because I had all that activities commit to here. So I'm, I'm glad that you didn't address the whole uh, competition uh, for Jello Fries there. <laughs> <laughs> because it looks as if the guardians are ahead of us anyway. But what about collaborative efforts? Oh. I mean, as an author, uh, are you looking forward to collaborative efforts uh, with uh, your contemporaries or other yeah. authors as, uh, as well? Um, to collaborate with people, yeah? Um, that that would probably be later on in the future because, to be honest, everybody wants to do their thing at the moment. I have a lot of friends that are poets, ones that have been nominated for T.S. Eliot, but notwithstanding, everybody wants to, like, do their thing. Every, nobody wants to share credit. We live in a greedy society these days, but I'm always open to collaboration. I'm not someone who wants to take all the credit to myself. I'm open to collaboration. I'm also open to uh, mentoring anyone that is inspired to start writing poetry. Uh, Joe, jo, you, you mentioned a few of your works, of course, in Joe's uh, Colotania, uh, whilst we were making some of your submissions. Let's talk about maybe your favorite, you know, and of course, tell us okay. the backstory to your uh, favorite collection in this, uh, in this work of yours. Mm -hmm. um, so my favorite story would be Anarchist Diplomatique. So that talks about the colonialism and the neocolonial entanglements. Um, so if you if you start that poem, you'd see it said at first the French came with an idea to organize the uncivilized, and then they gave in to the British monarch, and then they traded youth's life for material prize, that is the king's. So if you read through that um, anarchist diplomatic, then you would see the issue we have in Africa. That you would see our problem is not because we lack resources; it's because we lack proper management. Now, everyone would feel like, okay, the person in power is not doing fine until they themselves come into power. I remember reading a book by Anthony Robbins. It said, you never know how to behave until you yourself is placed in that person's position. That is when your, three, your true attributes are then exerted on that position. So 
that anarchy is diplomatic is just to guide everyone to understand that what we are currently experiencing is the enslavement we have mentally. It doesn't have anything to do with what one person is doing or what one person is not doing. If we are able to govern ourselves and able to account for our own resources, then we will do better as a nation. I mean, even in this country I'm living in, if you go through the news and you see what's going on, you would all your, your green passports, you would all get like this if you read the news of things that are going on in this country. So every country has their own um, beats and beats. But at the end of the day, in Africa, we actually suffer from neocolonial entanglements. So that's what that poem is about. All right. Uh, you, you, this particular work, where can uh, readers uh, get this, uh, your uh, Joe Colatina? So uh, uh, if they have to reach out and uh, they would want to, of course, many of people are very interested in getting a hand on this uh, collection of works. Um, basically, it's available on Amazon. Um, it's available on Okada Books, but I heard that Okada is closing down by November 30th. So um, yeah, I will I ask the publisher so, okay. to actually create another avenue for the ebook version. And it will be out on Roving Heights soon. They're still um, mediating um, the percentage and everything behind that. So let's say mid December, it will be on Roving Heights and uh, other platforms as well. But what about now, the audio book? Are, are you going to convert to an audio version? Uh, audio version, that can be done. That's not a problem. That should probably mm. be before um, June next year. Yeah, before June next year, it should be out on Spotify. Awesome. All right. I'll be looking forward to your future works as well because I've been interested in talking to, uh, uh, you know, an author who knows his onion and exactly knows exactly the, the, the world of uh, literature mm. and can actually put it out there for uh, lots of people, especially Nigerians. Uh, a lot of people can relate to your work because um, personally they've experienced it as well. You know, are you on social media as well so that uh, those who are watching right now can also contact you? As you mentioned, mentorship. What are your handles, sir? Uh, um, basically, you can contact me on Instagram. Is J A O-M-E-K-E, -E, that's all. If you need to contact me, don't contact me for just familiarity, but if need be, you can contact me. I'm a very friendly person. Uh, I don't buy it. <laughs> I don't actually, <laughs> but you can contact me. don't buy it. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua Obeka. is the author of uh, Joe's uh, Collectenia, yep. uh, a work that comprises of uh, different uh, poetry or poems on uh, different subjects that he has in the archive and since 2019. So have a good day, Joe. You too. Bye for now. Yes. Bye for now.